Welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College is built on Indigenous land, the land of the Huron Wanda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land, also the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here. Today, we're talking about ethics. This is the third ethics series that Massey College has launched. Ethics is an important part of the principalship, of my principalship. This is what I wanted to present to the junior fellows, knowing that they will be leaders in their field and that they required ethicals to become the best leaders that they can be. And today we're going to talk about ethics in politics. And I'm delighted that one of our junior fellow will be participating in discussion. So I'm very grateful to the uh, leadership of Tom Axworthy in putting together this series. And I wanna thank him for all the good work that he's done. And I'm going to let him start the series on ethics in politics. Do we have what ethics standard should we demand? Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, afternoon everyone, everyone, and uh, thank, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Tom Maxworthy, and uh, this is a, a continuing series on ethics that uh, we uh, inaugurated at uh, Massey College. And the particular topic that we are on today, which is political parties and campaigns, came out of the uh, last year's discussion on political ethics uh, in, in general, where we had the F uh, former ethics commissioner of Canada on issues like the WE scandal and so on uh, came up. But in the uh, questions, there were several about political parties, financing, candidate recruitment, negative advertising and so on. So we thought it would be a very good idea to begin our uh, ethical series uh, for uh, 2021 by addressing the uh, the issue of uh, campaigning and political parties. When we chose this topic, we didn't know that we would be in the last days of uh, an election campaign. So, uh, but it does bring a certain immediacy uh, to this uh, discussion. So I'm gonna quickly introduce our panel, then ask them to make some opening um, uh, statements and uh, remarks. Then we'll have some discussion together and then open it up for questions uh, from the Massey and the YouTube uh, audience. So, uh, Sheila Gervais is uh, a former national director of the Liberal Party and has uh, been known for many years as a reformer, has written and advocated uh, a host of actions to try and improve not only her party, but the political a system of uh, Canada. Uh, Monica Leroy has been working with us at Massey on another project that we're working on, which is the creation of a Democracy Canada Institute uh, abroad. And she has, uh, like Sheila, a long background in Canadian uh, domestic politics, uh, working in Mr. Harper's PMO and an advisor to Foreign Minister John Baird. Uh, but in uh, as well as that domestic side of her of her work. She's been working internationally on how to create and develop party systems around the world and currently is with the Organization of American States. So uh, Monica brings both uh, domestic and international experience to this important uh, uh, topic. And then as the principal mentioned, uh, uh, Cam uh, Galindo is one of our junior fellows at Massey and as well as the as the experts that we try to bring on these ethical panels. Uh, we always like to have junior fellows um, to have that fresh perspective of, of people who are just starting out on their leadership path, uh, as opposed to some of us like myself who are getting around the last track. Uh, and uh, as well as his, uh, his uh, academic achievements, Cam has also recently uh, won a election as a school trustee. So he also has experience in local uh, elected politics. So we have a, an excellent panel with uh, different perspectives and backgrounds on this very important topic. And um, I think, uh, Sheila, I'll uh, begin with you that 
uh, just about the time that uh, we had our first panel on political ethics in general, Elections Canada brought out a report on uh, how to improve ethics in parties and raised issues like yeah. finance, and a code of conduct and all of that. So I'd like to start with you as a, as a woman who was the, a central player in one of our major parties. Thanks, Tom. Uh, happy to be here. So my, uh, my interest lies very much on the political process side of things with the relationships between the parliamentary and operational wings of parties and uh, the law. Who is the most appropriate to be designing these systems? The main players or should, they be, should these decisions be made uh, at arm's length? So parties remain highly protective of their internal processes and balk at any intrusions. Over time, I think I believe that this has led to a detachment from the public, it used to be a link through membership and a focus on parties themselves. So for example, the Liberal Party no longer seems to be holding nomination meetings when an incumbent is involved, renominating automatically on their ability to raise money, knock on doors and make phone calls, not on how many debates they participated in or how many files they handled for their constituents. Um, and I might add as well, we train uh, our candidates on how to be candidates. We don't train them on how to be members of parliament. We don't train them on the ethical uh, conduct of, uh, of, of themselves. Uh, recently, Elections Canada, as Tom has mentioned, conducted an examination of a possible code of ethics for political parties. And the political parties basically said, oh, that's very interesting, but uh, we can do that on our own. Much better. Thank you very much. One of my main interests, as Tom has mentioned, is the role of money in the political system combined with ethics. Marketers talk about branding, where the public ties certain values or attributes to a product or service. For organizations, they often speak of reputation marketing. Effectively, political parties seek money to market their brand, not their ideas. But when negative attributes attach themselves to a party's brand, it's their reputation that suffers. We're all well aware of the many and numerous examples of these negative attributes when it comes to money in the political system. The public doesn't realize how much actual public money is in the system and what politicians and parties do to access it. But they do seem to understand when rules about political money are changed seemingly on a whim and for the benefit of one party or another. And they understand that it's the money, not the public interest, that so very often influences public policy. So witness the recent stories here in Ontario about Ford, uh, Premier Ford, doubling, doubling contribution limits to over $6,000 per individual. And then what I call doubling down on the Highway 413 Greenbelt Development Project and that was followed by stories on those same developers being the major funders of the PC party. And what did the PC party do after that? That was followed by PC party ads, provincial PC party ads against Trudeau and the federal liberals. So you have to wonder a little bit about that. The public also doesn't know about the 1%. The political financing elite, I call them, only about 1% or, or less of the public donates to political parties and they seem to get 100% of the policy influence. If we have time later, I'd like to explain more explicitly just how much public money is in the system and how it gets there. But I do want to raise one issue and that is tax credits. All the tax credits that the 1% receive are actually an indirect flow through of public money to political parties. And we can, we can explain that uh, later if people are interested. It seems the only time that we get real and proper financing reform is when the reputation of a party or politician has become so sullied by the pursuit of money that an 
often outgoing politician in a majority situation makes a systemic change. Parties are so used to the functioning of this system that the politician that tries to improve the system is often denigrated by their peers and their own party. Remember, dumber than a bag of hammers. To me, there are links between our highly publicly subsidized political financing system and policy influence and wasted time and effort by politicians and parties in the pursuit of money. Policy influence fueled by highly subsidized money, uh, public money, that together fueled binary politics and policy lurch. Effort, financial and human resources that parties could be put to better use, making their case to the public. Public doesn't care about these things except for the scandals and what they do to the reputation of politicians and parties. I will say three words that have caught politicians of many stripes right across the country at many levels for quite a while now, cash for access. Because of the very obvious vested interests of parties and politicians, they should be removed in my view from the design of whatever financing regime is put in place. Put the decision in the hands of the public. Uh, I propose that political financing reforms and regimes in general be designed by a citizen-oriented deliberative process. And no longer would you have Greenbelt developers donating upwards of $6,000 just because they can. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Sheila. Uh, often comparisons are made with the United States and the financing system and Canadians pat themselves on the back since we've been controlling expenses and donations since 1974, but your talk uh, seems to imply that you think that a lot more needs to be done. So we, we may well get back to that uh, later. Uh, uh, Monica, we've just heard uh, Sheila talking about a particular issue that preoccupies her, which is the, the financing of, uh, of uh, parties. You have both uh, national and international experience. Tell us a little bit about your perspective on ethics campaigns and political parties. Is this a serious issue uh, or is it is it one which um, interests people like us, but in fact, you think that, uh, that parties have ethics well in hand? Well, Tom, uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to join you and the Massey team, uh, Shirley. Uh, Con, it's great to meet you as well. Um, I think I'd like to take a step back uh, and just talk about kind of the importance of political parties, period. I mean, political right. parties, what their role in democracy is, they're essential, they're essential part of any healthy democracy because they allow political actors to come together as a cohesive group to provide like a coherent policy choice for citizens. That means citizens should know what they're choosing when they vote people into office. And at the same time, they actually have groups on the outside, po political parties on the outside that are in opposition that are going to hold that government accountable and hold them to the promises that they made. I mean, these institutions exist to level the playing field. Um, and allow for citizens to more actively participate in a different lever of government. Um, they're also important vehicles for training and learning as young politicians and young political actors because it allows or should be allowing um, individual politicians or those who want to get involved how to work on collaboration and co cooperation, how to build consensus on policy points and how, how to work with a broader team. So they should be training grounds for parliamentarians, for incoming government officials, because that's the pseudo government functioning that they should be having within themselves. Um, when looking at democratic development internationally and abroad, um, a key part of political party assistance is the development of parties' bylaws and codes of conduct. Um, mm. And these choices often dictate how a party will approach to a host of issues, everything from financing and expenditures to transparency and accountability, as well as issues and gender on gender and minority representation, which are the top issues that I would consider important in a conversation about ethics and political parties. Um, and just as a note, in my current position at the, the OAS, um, the OAS in 2001 introduced something called the Inter-American Democratic Charter. And this is a very unique document because it was signed, it, it was unanimous consensus for 34 countries in the Western Hemisphere, including Canada, um, that essentially serves as a constitution for the Americas where they have enshrined democracy as a right of the people and not only enshrined it as a right, but they've actually created a responsibility for states in the international community to engage in cases where other states aren't actually meeting their obligations for democracy. 
Um, mm -hmm. Article three of the Inter-American Democratic Charter prescribes the pl uh, pluralistic system of political parties and organizations as an essential element of democracy. Why is this important? Ethics is a part of culture. Um, it's an approach to how you, be it as an individual a political party or a government, engages with the world around it. And corruption, on the other hand, is the counterculture and is very much a part of culture to the same degree that ethics would be. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because corruption is the greatest threat to democracy and prosperity that around the world that we're facing right now. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to kind of the key points that I, I mentioned in the concept of a code of conduct, um, how political parties are financed is a significant defining point um, in terms of how power structures are gonna be made and how decision pro processes is gonna be made. Is it through the wealth of a small hand, handful of individuals? Is it through amassing small, gra small scale grassroots donations? Um, we have seen examples in both developed and developing countries that the former creates a scenario where those who elected can be beholden to the wants of a few that funded them to be there. Um, in the United States is probably the most uh, most prevalent example where we see the influence of super PACs and powerful lobby groups that have the capacity to direct large scale campaign contributions to candidates. Um, therefore, those candidates, once elected, are more more likely to feel obligated to the people that got them there than to their mass constituents, the mass of their constituents. Um, in other scenarios where the influence is less heavy, um, you are less obvious and less apparent, you still see scenarios where government contracts are awarded to people that provide the right political support, create the right noise and support governments in that capacity. I mean, I think we've seen this come up in Canada at the federal level um, a number of times in recent history. Um, I, I Surely I'm gonna have to disagree with you a little bit on, on the scale, not to say that, um, Canada's finance, political financing system is perfect, but comparatively around the world, we have found a system where for the most part, we've done our best to limit the capacity of private sector donations and orient it towards grassroots financing of citizens um, rather than private sector or other uh, special interest groups' interests. Um, the next point would be transparency and accountability. Um, this is another key issue in determining the ethics of a culture. Our decision making process is open and accessible. How internal are the voting how internal voting processes completed? Um, do every does everybody get a say? And I think one of the most important elements of this are the same set of rules applied to everybody. Um, the last issue I want to touch on in this particular point is the question of how party responds to issues around uh, representation on gender and uh, minority groups. Um, mm -hmm. For example, in countries where there's quotas. Uh, place to ensure that there's women's representation, you often see women and minority candidates valued in that very narrow sense where they can secure the quote unquote bonus seats, um, but are limited in, a, in, the, in the fashion that nobody wants them to take the regular seats from what's often the male majority. Um, then you see scenarios where you have countries running with list systems where women are placed much lower on the list. In a country like Canada or the United States where it's based on a, a candidacy per riding, it, if you take a closer look at which are the ridings where women and minority groups are given as seats where they're eligible to run it. Um, are they seats that are safe that are very likely for that party to win or are they ones that are more challenging? So it's not just about the number of candidates, but where are the candidates and what is their likelihood of entering, getting, gaining office? Um, and that doesn't just stop with elections. It's how do these parties engage with their individuals in, in once they're in government or once they're in opposition? Um, and how are these voices included in the policy process? I think this touches on some very important, the very important tension between tokenism and whether it's full participation. Um, in Canada, I think we have a challenge with this because the way that cabinets are put together, it creates a number of really interesting questions on this point. Um, because each cabinet is designed specifically to ensure that you have cross country representation. So you want representation from every province and every, every uh, territory if possible. Um, and you wanna make sure that there is as close to equal gender participation as possible, representation as possible. And you wanna make sure that indigenous communities and other minority groups are represented in cabinet as well. Um, which makes for an interesting calculus when you're creating a cabinet and you're picking going down the priority list. And just because they're in cabinet doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that their inclusion translates into equal representation and an equal voice around the table and equal seniority within cabinet. Um, the last point that I want to touch on just kind of as an opener is that in this conversation about ethics, I think we're also seeing around the world that there's a growing disconnect among populations that 
are calling for and are demanding greater ethic and greater accountability for corruption, um, then and, and then how that translates into where their votes are and what's happening. Um, the rise of populism has laid bare, bare a number of vulnerabilities of that even in most of our our most developed in economies and societies. I think we've seen the COVID nineteen pandemic has only exacerbated these tension points. Um, an interesting example would be the term of Donald Trump, where his campaign he was elected to office under slogans like "Drain the Swamp" and claiming that he's going to challenge the status quo of a corrupt political culture in Washington by bringing the set private sector voices in there. As we all know, he came, he brought with him um, an administration that had, that, that was like a quagmire of ethical quandaries and, and, and challenges around corruption. Um, in Latin America, um, frustration with the limited ability of governments to deliver for their citizens um, exacerbated from some very high profile and kind of international corruption scandals has helped garner popular support for prominent political figures that also themselves have autocratic tendencies. Um, this can be seen in examples from uh, Hugo Chavez under Venezuela. I think the current government's a very different conversation, um, but also the current governments that we're seeing in Brazil and El Salvador, where what the public is demanding versus the tendencies that we're seeing with the government don't necessarily align. Um, I think in Canada, we can see a number of examples over the past 20 years um, where ethics and uh, questions around corruption, government corruption have played a key role in our, our federal elections. Um, in 2006, a key, a key plank of Stephen Harper's platform was the Federal Accountability Act. Um, mm -hmm. That was slogan in one of his most significant deliverables from his first term where he embedded within Ottawa and within the political class at that time a very strict code of conduct in terms of how to engage with lobbyists and how to engage with outside influences of money. Um, I think in the current administration you're also seeing um, the Prime Minister for the first time in history has actually been cited multiple times with violations by the Ethics Commissioner. Um, but that's not necessarily translating into uh, a, re a response or a criticism from public in the same way. Um, so I think as much as these these are all tension points that we have to look in, at the same time, I think there's a question of, is this what the public's demanding and how are we having these conversations in the public space? Good. Thank you, Monica. <clears throat> and you've raised the issue of uh, of codes, which, which uh, colleague uh, countries in uh, South America may have adopted. I'd like to come back to that. Do we think we need this in Canada as well? And uh, Cam, now to uh, to you. You've heard two uh, women with great experience in uh, in uh, Canadian politics. Do, do you feel that our parties are ethically challenged? And in your own experience, have you uh, had some ethical dilemmas as you sought a campaign at the local level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much, Tom. I, I think the irony of my presence here is that I'm approaching this topic with probably more questions than actual answers, uh, but maybe that's the local politician me with that local experience. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, um, yes, I'm currently a resident junior fellow here at Massey College. I'm in the process of completing my master's in public policy at the Monk School. And of course, in 2018, I was elected trustee uh, to the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board in Hamilton where I'm currently serving as vice chair of the board, and I also chair our finance and facilities committee. Uh, on that note, uh, contributing to what Sheila and Monica had to say, uh, one of the questions I have is, you know, what ethical obligation, if any, do political parties, politicians, and campaigns have? When your job is to win, to persuade, and to mobilize, to do what, to, uh, you know, do what ends uh, justify the means? And uh, I think, Really, it's a balance uh, between risk and reward for a lot of these candidates and campaigns. I think we've seen the benefit of using inflammatory and defamatory language in campaigns, uh, particularly in some of that political communication, uh, because we see that it offers a higher return than a long, boring debate on policy issues. Uh, and to that point, it's much easier to vilify a candidate or a party than it is to actually take the time to offer a platform and solutions policy issues. Uh, and really, that's what the entire Trump campaign was about. And I've heard a couple of my colleagues here talk about that. Um, he, he virtually got elected with no campaign platform, but really using single zingers and lines to um, gather the masses and, and to pull the vote uh, and, and get people to come out and vote. So 
uh, you know, what, the other question I have is how do you incentivize taking the high road versus the low road politically when we're seeing that uh, there's a better benefit to taking the low road sometimes? Uh, does that mean uh, that ethics and politics is eroding? Uh, and maybe it has been for some time. I don't know. I, I haven't been around long enough, but it, it seems to me that it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, uh, we feel the influence of American politics and the revolving political culture and climate in Canadian politics as well. The challenge is how do politicians and elected officials hold themselves accountable uh, for their actions? Um, when we look at the internal structure of a campaign, I think the buck stops with the candidate in most cases. Uh, and when it stops at the candidate, then their team is made accountable. Uh, but what happens when the buck doesn't stop with the candidate? Uh, I think as voters, voting is one way for us to demonstrate our disapproval. Uh, but the media also has an important role to play. And I think that's something that we should talk about today at some point. Uh, interestingly, uh, things that you might do in a campaign environment are also things that you may not necessarily do after the election when you uh, suddenly have to shift your focus from campaigning to governing. Uh, and I think that disconnect is something that we, we see fairly often during uh, different campaign periods. Uh, in terms of campaign finance at the federal level, uh, it's not a topic that I'm an expert in, uh, but I think it's obvious that campaigns have become a lot more expensive and fundraising uh, is a major form of competition among parties uh, and often a contributor of success. Uh, I'm definitely in support of laws that help curve influence by wealthy donors while also encouraging the development of more broad-based financial support for parties and candidates uh, from uh, all citizens. Um, and Tom, to your question about looking at this from the local context, uh, specifically at the municipal level, uh, I think it certainly varies across the country and from province to province. Uh, municipalities exist in Canada only through the delegation of provincial powers and authority on local matters. Uh, and so the composition of and, and the powers that municipalities have do vary from province to province. Um, I think municipalities often operate more like corporations than they do governments. And with mm. that, uh, rules and campaigns also vary from place to place. Uh, so that is to say things get a lot more chaotic at the municipal level. Uh, you know, <clears throat> public interest and awareness on local candidates and campaigns tend to decrease. Uh, to very low levels in comparison to provincial and federal election matters. Uh, what I can tell you is that there is almost like a trickle down effect on political interest and awareness on issues where voters introduce topics that they're following federally or provincially on municipal matters. Uh, and suddenly, you know, that it's not necessarily within their preview or, uh, for local candidates to deal with, but it's, it's something that does end up trickling down. And, um, you know, a, a political discussion is a political discussion, but I think the challenge for us is really how do we engage people uh, in uh, insightful and um, educated discussions rather than just um, choosing to go after politicians for uh, their character or their decisions to run in the first place. Um, so, yeah, I think I think we are ethically challenged right now in Canada, but most places around the world are probably facing something similar. Good. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, Cam will will take up those questions in our in our second round. So, so we've um, heard uh, Cam has raised issues about uh, communications and negative advertising, and what are the internal controls, if any, in in conduct, particularly around uh, the uh, communication issue. Uh, Monica rightly began by making the point that parties are absolutely essential to democracy. People love to attack them, and, the, and uh, the broad public often does, but our democracies could not be organized without them. So the, the intent is how to, how to improve um, party operations, uh, not uh, damn them. And uh, Sheila then raised um, a very important issue around the financing of parties, which Many in Canada had thought that we had basically solved, but she raised important issues about that. So let's just take them in reverse uh, or, uh, order to the presentation. So we'll start with Cam's question and, and get Sheila and, and Monica to respond to it. What about this question then, then about the, the uh, communications and the heat of a battle, the negative uh, attacks, uh, the character assassination and, and, and so on? 
Are there ethical issues in, involved in that? Or is that just the way campaigns are done now in the 21st century? Who'd like to start on that? Monica, why don't you and then Sheila? Um, I think absolutely we've seen mudslinging become a central part of uh, political discourse and political discussion. I think the internet has been a huge piece of this. Um, how many candidates, um, and forgive me, I, I probably haven't followed as closely this time around, but if I think back to the 2000, uh, the election in Canada two years ago, the federal election, I mean, I think you saw over those first couple of weeks, there was tweets coming up from people's high school, like stories that people tracked down on Facebook from like 15 years ago, um, <laughs> that, that people were coming up where there's just, we're in a different moment where our footprints and accessibility of kind of mistakes and bad judgment calls that people have made in their past are much more readily accessible. Um, so I think that sort of personal attack on it really sets a tone for um, a hostility, uh, a hostile campaign and hostile interaction Actions. It's really hard to come back from uh, people attacking others on such a deep personal level. Um, and I, again, I think this is a question of how the media and we as a society choose to respond to it. If that's what we focus and we give a lot of attention to, if that becomes the story, then you're getting rewarded for negative behavior. And so that's positive reinforcement. So you're gonna continue and you're gonna to continue to escalate. I mean, I think what we're seeing right now in Canada in the federal elections, I mean, it's the pattern for the last week of the election. Um, you've laid your policy choices on the table. Now it's my job to just make sure the other guy looks like the bad choice for you. Um, and again, if it works, that's the reward they're going to get for that behavior. I mean, coming back to some of the other points that we're talking about ethics, if 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 there's complaints and announcements about ethics violations, if there's reports on corruption scandals, and there's no meaningful consequence for it, bad behavior is going to get rewarded, and they're going to continue along that path. Good, thank you, uh, Sheila. Um, uh, Cam asked about whether this is a real issue uh, in 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 terms of. The, the communication and the character assassinations that matter so much mm -hmm. part of politics. But he also raised, are there internal mechanisms to try to govern that or to, or to uh, perhaps have a higher standard uh, than what we have been seeing? What, what is your take on the issue and what are the internal mechanisms that govern this in your experience? Well, back to basics, I suppose, in a way, I mean, I alluded in, uh, in my discussion a little bit about political financing that parties have become, and it is in large measure because of uh, uh, communications in the internet and, and so on and so forth, but much more uh, centralized. Uh, they are run much more centrally. You have writing associations that uh, are basically made up of parliamentary staff and so on. There's so much less of a connection uh, to the public. Um, I spoke a little bit about, you know, the nomination process. Mm -hmm. um, there used to be a huge uh, a, a amount of uh, money influencing the nomination process. Um, and I think as one of the mechanisms that parties have used to sort of get away from that, they've taken control of the, of the process completely unto, unto themselves. So you basically have the party itself uh, choosing candidates on the basis of their electability or uh, things of that nature, as opposed to their relationship with the, with the public. And I think that, that, all of these kind of diminutions of uh, of linkages to to the public lead to 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 this sort of uh, uh, situation. But but one one of the one of the things that I want to focus in on uh, in that regard is how our all of our systems are leading to this binary kind of. Uh, politics that we have, what Keith Davey used to, you know, call it, you're fat, so you're bald. Um, and I relate a lot of that back to, um, and I hope this isn't too off topic, but to our electoral system as well. 
So we have a situation where um, uh, I'm just losing my train of thought there a little bit. Um, we, we have a situation now where uh, the way uh, uh, members are elected does not relate very well to their support uh, among, amongst the public. Um, and uh, there's very little incentive for cooperation amongst the parties. If the public doesn't contemplate in advance where parties are going to be agreeing, um, it makes it very, very difficult for them to, to make those ultimate choices. And the parties end up uh, being, having to be always polar opposites. And I guess my long way around <laughs> try, uh, 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 is, is trying to indicate how that um, uh, uh, creates these necessities for negative advertising because it, it no longer becomes uh, about uh, policy agreement or policy distinction. It uh, reverts to personality and, uh, and uh, behavioral discussions. Good, thank you. Well, uh, Cam, does that... Uh illuminate in some way your your question about the internal mechanisms. Uh, mm -hmm. I recall in my experience that in one of, one of our campaigns, uh, when we reviewed the advertising, there was an attack ad on, I think it was Joe Clark, which was very negative, quite funny. Um, uh, and we showed it as we did all the ads to Pierre Trudeau at the time. And he laughed along with the rest of us, but said, I'm not going to be associated with that. And, yeah, and that was that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but that was dependent on the particular personality and background of the leader who we were showing them to. Um, is that the kind of issue that you were trying to get at? How do, how do parties have standards or not? I think so. And, and you know, the consequence of, of that form of politics is really the erosion of the democratic process. Political parties still have a job to do after the election. They need to govern. And I think we all have a role to play in determining and incur and, and really creating those mechanisms for accountability uh, for how we can demand better quality politicians and, and forms of politics uh, and campaigning. I think there's many different ways of doing them. Sheila, for example, talked about the nomination process. Um, if there's a way to improve that process so that there are opportunities to uh, select candidates based not just on their electability, but more on their ability to govern and work with others, their beliefs and stance on policy issues, um, I think there's work to be done there. Um, I do want to bring back this the, the importance of media and the role that reporters play uh, because... Uh, you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult for reporters to stay on topic, to focus on, on what the real issues are. And, and I think part of that is, you know, um, the, the financial structure and, and um, the fact that a lot of media companies are becoming less profitable over time means that they're relying on clickbait and they're relying on the stories that people are, are more interested in because of the dramatization or entertainment factor that comes with politics now. Um, I, I think it's it's we need to demand more of reporters to make sure that uh, they call it for what it is. And, uh, you know, if we expect better ethics or ethical behavior from our politicians, particularly during campaign period, then I would hope that uh, reporters could be in a position where they're supported as well uh, to call that out and to expect better from our politicians. And then, of course, uh, you know, the responsibility that each individual voter has, um, you know, they have a duty to do their homework on candidates, to vote, of course, and to educate themselves. Uh, and there's probably something to be said there about our education system as a whole. And uh, I think if, if we, uh, you know, work to continually improve our education system, I can speak for the Ministry of Education in Ontario, where, uh, you know, there, we, we need to improve our civics course, for example. How do we get young people uh, interested and educated on political matters now so that uh, they grow up to become voters? Um, you know, those are, I think, issues that, that we need to look at. But uh, maybe the, the common theme here is, is that there isn't just one solution. It's, it's a work that, needs, it's work that needs to be done on multiple different um, levels and, and 
perhaps looking at this from a holistic point of view might be helpful. <clears throat> just on that, uh, just on that point, um, we, we of course invite questions from uh, from our audience. But one has come in from a cash, which is exactly on the point that uh, that uh, Cam raised, which is which is um, what do we do uh, to educate the broader public so that they will be intolerant of uh, party lapses? We've been talking about internal mechanisms. A cash and now uh, Cam has raised the broader element about the uh, public. What do we think about that in, in, in terms of the way that voters and the public ethical issues? Is there is there a real need to make this more central to Canadian voters when they're they're voting on child care and climate change and uh, uh, perhaps even a few about the need to balance the budget. Uh, not many that I've seen lately, but uh, what about the broader public as opposed to the internal party? Sheila, let's start with you on that one in response, in response to Cam's point. Yeah, well, in in response to, to both and, and uh, yeah. Akash's uh, uh, comment as well, um, one of the things that uh, I've been uh, intrigued with, uh, with one of the organizations that I've been doing some work with, which is uh, Fair Vote Canada, in their uh, pursuit of electoral reform, particularly they're focused on, uh, on a move to proportional representation, is that countries uh, around the world that have successfully reformed their electoral systems, their financing systems, and so on and so forth, have taken these decisions uh, away from politicians who have a vested interest and a conflict of interest often in, uh, in these sorts of things. One little example I'd like to uh, throw in is, um, and this, this is where um, uh, Monica and I uh, may have you know, some disagreements, but um, uh, Mr. Harper removed the per vote subsidy that Mr. Kretzian had brought in um, as a sidebar. Unfortunately, Mr. Kretzian brought it in as sort of a hybrid situation, leaving in place a lot of the other public uh, subsidies that were there. But um, uh, he, he made the decision to get rid of the per vote subsidy. Um, the per vote subsidy uh, on the face of it, and as you dive into the numbers, is uh, much, has a much greater relationship uh, uh, from the public. So every member of the public has their vote represented, has their intentions represented uh, through, through that process as opposed to this 1% uh, elite uh, that I was talking about. So uh, what a lot of these countries have done is they have taken the decisions about the electoral system, and I'm proposing that we do that as well for financing regimes to citizens assemblies. So because the public actually is very engaged in these issues. If you, if you look at uh, polling uh, statistics now in Canada about proportional representation, it is to a very high uh, um, rate that the public uh, supports it. It's politicians that don't support it. And um, you, you, you constantly hear about, well, in BC, it was rejected several times. It wasn't rejected. Uh, and it wasn't even soundly rejected. Uh, the public voted uh, to a high degree, 58%, over 60% in, in one instance. It's just that the threshold of that referendum was high. When parties put in place referenda, for example, on these types of issues, uh, for example, and it's happened at the provincial level uh, several times, um, they do not put in place all the supports that are required. They don't support a fair process in other words, they don't want the change to be made, so they create you know, a number of uh, pitfalls. Parties often propose to make these sorts of changes, and then when they get elected, their members of parliament say, hey, no, 
that doesn't work for me. So they always do what's good for parties, not what's good for, uh, the, pro for, for the political uh, system and not what's good for governing. So I, I would suggest that, that this is one area uh, that we should look at a lot more in Canada. I understand that the federal government is starting to use some of these deliberative uh, processes uh, a little bit more, but I think that that's, we've, we've got a major ethical uh, conundrum uh, every time we try to make changes. I, I, I referred to um, uh, uh, dumb as a bag of hammers comment, which was a comment made by the president of the Liberal Party of Canada when Mr. Kretzian made the change to the per vote subsidy. And Mr. Kretzian did that basically as a response to, uh, to the, to the, to the sponsorship scandal. So obviously, you know, he was trying to do something uh, uh, to almost enforce more ethical standards. Um, but because of the policy lurch that we always end up with from majority government to majority government, it was easily removed. Um, uh, in Quebec, uh, in the last Quebec election, all three of the parties agreed that they would bring in proportional representation. It was in all of their platforms. They all agreed. Once they got elected, their MPP said, uh -uh, we're not going, going there anymore. So um, I know I'm I'm off on my yes. my own little bent here, but uh, I th I think that these these uh, kinds of decisions have to be removed from the political process. Monica, over over to you. Sheila's raised inevitably in any discussion about <laughs> Canadian politics, we come up with PR versus first past the post, but I uh, <laughs> and the broader uh, issue of financing and so on again. Uh, give me your uh, responses, please. So um, there's a lot to unpack there, Sheila. Thank yes, you. Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm I as a as a practitioner in the field of democratic development. Uh, I'm a firm believer that democracy is a process, and it's not an end. And forever, even the most fine-tuned democracies, we're going to be adjusting and tweaking and moderating and, and, and working on our systems as society evolves and, and, and society changes and, and reflecting to better reflect what the citizens want to need. Um, I'm personally not a proponent of blowing up a system that functions well, um, because we think a completely different system that we don't know how that would realize in Canada might potentially work. Um, so I think, I, I mean, personally, I don't think that PR is the answer to anything. And I also don't think a PR system in Canada is necessarily going to produce the outcome that people think it's going to. I mean, I think just take a look at the polling numbers uh, in the current election. And I think the government that would come out if this was a PR election would be very different than what a lot of Canadians are expecting or would probably be wanting to see. Um, and I'm not sure that a PR system necessarily is going to touch on and really address this question of ethics that we have. Mm -hmm. um, without getting into the rationale and reasons about um, why the per vote subsidy was eliminated, I wasn't there at the time. I wasn't part of those conversations, so I, I can't really comment on that particular scenario. I mean, I think what Canada has done really well on the financing front is that we have managed to better than most remove external influences from our campaign i think the one thing that we do have to be very concerned and cautious about is the increasing role that third party groups are playing in our elections and more importantly actually in our pre-election rents um, i think you would actually see in the months leading up to the last few federal elections it's actually a number of private sector union groups that are spending the largest amount of money on political mm -hmm. ads to influence the outcome of it and that's not necessarily a reflection of what their their voting membership is it's what the leadership of those particular groups want to convey and want to articulate um, 
I think you're starting to see the creation of kind of PACs and other media affiliates that are following the same sort of loophole about external support and campaigns that and media that's happening in advance of elections, that they're starting to find ways to bring this third party voice into Canada, which from my opinion is what's taking away from the broader conversation between citizens directly with their elected officials. Um, as we're seeing with this campaign, with the previous campaign in Canada, very much the, the election becomes a question of brand rather than a genuine policy debate. Um, I don't know how many of you guys all watched the three debates that we had here in Canada. I was disappointed that there was only one in English, but meanwhile, there were there were two French debates, which is great. I think we, we should would have been benefited from a, more discourse from our leaders and in, in, for the English Canada as well. Um, there was a limited discussion about policy and ideas and it was a that debate was kind of set up in a manner where it was a lot of zingers back and forth rather than getting into the actual substance of what people wanted to do um where does the responsibility lie of that i'm not going to sit there and critique the debate commission as I, they've had enough piling on in that to begin with they're trying to create something that the voting, voting public is going to want to watch and pay attention to. Um, but what are the discussions that are happening on the campaign trail? When, pol when, when leaders are announcing policy platforms, is there a genuine challenge on the other side to kind of countermeasure and respond to that policy statement? Does that provoke a policy discussion about what these people want to do for our country? Um, I mean, you had one campaign, you've only had one candidate that actually release their full platform early on in the campaign with time for people to review and critique and provide that. Um, they think the, the other platforms weren't actually released until very close to the debates, which was only like a week ago. So it's how do you have a effective policy discussion about commitment, about commitments and plans without there being actually policy in the discourse? Um, I mean, I think these are challenges that we have to ask ourselves because the media are fighting for their survival. So they're trying to create news in a sense that's going to draw in the public and draw in audience and draw in votes and clicks. Um, and an intensive policy debate on how we're gonna structure this element of the carbon tax might not actually be something that's gonna get people watching watching the news. Good, thank you. And um, on a second important area, uh, and Cam, we'll begin with you, both Monica and Sheila have raised the idea of uh, explicit code of conduct for parties. Um, if we had one in Canada, would that, do you think, help or begin to address the issue that you raised in your, in your first discussion about, uh, about the balance and, and incentivizing ethical behavior um, as opposed to more uh, nefarious kinds, is the is the code a good idea, and is that a, is that something that we should be trying to promote in Canada, in your view? And then I want to go do to you, mm -hmm. our colleagues who who raised the idea in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Manitoba has a good example of what a code could look mm -hmm. like, perhaps uh, at a federal level. Um, and then, of course, um, I think someone was citing the Elections Canada paper that was published, I think it was 2014, on the advantages and disadvantages of a code of ethics or a code of conduct for political parties. Uh, I think it could serve as a potential tool to strengthen our electoral democracy in Canada. Uh, I think I would be in support of that. Uh, but there's also a lot to consider uh, in terms of uh, what that code uh, could look like, what the development of it um, could be. Uh, who would enforce it and how it would be applied. Um, I think there's also philosophical issues on whether uh, a code uh, of conduct and ethics is appropriate in the domain of organized political parties, uh, particularly in a competitive campaign where activities conducted to win public office, uh, often uh, you know, a lot of those decisions and actions take place within uh, a gray area of, of, of mm -hmm. what can and can't be done. Um, I think there's a lot of questions that we would need to ask around how we define uh, ethics, how we define morality, what we define as good and bad. Um, and this, this notion around, um, you know, uh, values and principles and, and, and how we define those norms uh, could help guide the behaviors of parties, leaders and elected representatives. Um, but I think if we don't create a mechanism for enforcement, then a code could just become a symbolic gesture uh, that 
uh, the public could buy into, but I doubt would actually change the behavior of candidates and uh, leaders uh, in the federal election context. To, I, I'd like to uh, both both Monica and, and Sheila raised the idea of the of the code. Um, the thought just struck me <laughs> as we were uh, discussing this that that may be a wonderful project uh, for Massey College. Uh, we could start with this panel actually and invite others uh, to draw up a code, make it, you know, multipartisan, and M Massey College is a, is a nonpartisan institution, and actually work on a code ourselves and then see if our parties might want to adopt it or that parliament might, might want to adopt it. Is this a, is this a useful thing that, uh, that we should move on among the many other re reforms? And this, is this a good project uh, for Massey and can I sign you up? <laughs> Monica, I'll start with you and then Sheila. <laughs> um, I, I would like to uh, bring up that uh, Michael, Conservative MP Michael Chong did try to do something like this in the previous parliament. Um, and mm, mm -hmm. uh, while, while one of the parties, the Conservative Party did join, support his effort, he I believe that was the only party that actually expressed any interest of following some sort of code of conduct. So I think the concept of a desire for this versus the appetite or political will for it, there's a significant gap in Ottawa right now. Um, and and uh, Sheila, it's actually something that struck me from the first part, first comments that you made at the opening of the conversation today, where you were talking about um, guidelines and regulations and how they should be done, whether they should be done arm's length and with it or, or within the party. Um, as a political practitioner, the one thing, if in my former lives, the one thing that I kind of stumbled on, on quite frequently is when you have people governing politics that have never engaged in politics and don't know how the business of politics gets run, it's very convoluted how those rules and regulations applied. Um, and so you get some very tricky and complicated rulings from the lobbying commissioner and the ethics commissioner um, on what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do that isn't necessarily responsibly applicable to how the, it actually affects the job in the real way. Um, so I think having a completely external group make decisions about how politics should operate, there, there's a disconnect with the reality of, of doing business about it. I mean, I think if there's any lesson that we can take from the last five years in, in the United States, it's that sometimes like politicians is a profession um there is a degree of understanding of how the process works that we do need to respect um, and we do need to appreciate because governance is again it's a professional it's a profession um so i think any sort of discussion that has like that has this, this externally it very consciously needs to include the voices and the lenses of people that are actively engaged in democratic processes directly um personally i think as an external value and i would be very keen and obvious tom i'll support anything that you ever want to do um, <laughs> Good to uh, but know. <laughs> as, as I mean, I think this is, we keep talking about the question of where does the public land on these issues versus where do the practitioners land on this issue? And I think this is something that if you want the public to demand better ethics, this is a conversation you can have with citizens in terms of what is their expectation from politics. And then in turn, you're actually having that conversation with politicians and being like, this is what people are expecting from you. What is your response to this? Are you going to agree to this? This is what we want to demand of you. I think that's a conversation you can have with a citizen engaging with political parties, but I don't think you want it as a, as an external effort to impose that on political parties because internal efforts in Canada haven't been successful. Sheila, last, we're coming to the end of our, our uh, time together. Last words uh, to you. Well, I think there there's, there's a number of distinctions. One is there's a distinction between what we call the legislative political party and the operational political party. And so uh, in, in terms of code of, uh, of ethics or codes of conduct, um, I, you know, you look at the Michael Chong example that was on the uh, legislative side and 
even though you know that reform act became law i mean the the caucuses just said okay fine we're going to vote the way you know we want to vote and they just toss it out but it had no imposition on the party side and i think that's on the operational party side and i think that that's what elections canada uh, was looking at and what massey could easily uh, look at. And I think it goes back to uh, what I was discussing earlier about the, um, the relationship between how we choose our candidates, how we train our candidates and so on and so forth. And if there was a, a code of that nature that candidates were required to uh, sign, and that's a pact, not with their party, to conduct themselves in a certain way, but that's a pact with the public. Um, and if there was an element of training for all candidates in that regard, um, I, th I think that could move, you know, a long way forward. So, uh, you know, so I would I would go there on that. Um, I just want to say, gonna, just hmm? very very quickly because we're just going to wrap her up. Okay, well, I won't go there because I'm never. Quit. All right. <laughs> Sorry for cutting you off. So I no. want to uh, to thank the panel for a very stimulating discussion. Uh, we may even have a, a work plan for Massey going forward, which uh, uh, could be a very interesting uh, contribution, possibly. And uh, uh, the next uh, session on the uh, ethics series will be on the vexing question of ethics and vaccinations. So uh, please join us on uh, as this series uh, continues uh, over 2021, 2022. And uh, thanks again to the, to the panel for really illuminating this issue of parties campaigns. There's obviously much more to do and perhaps Massey and you will do some of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>